and our final speaker will be Carolyn Egan. Thank you, and thank you all for coming out on such a terrible night. And uh, thank you for all the speakers and our MCs. And uh, it's amazing to me that 25 years has passed since that time. I can't quite believe it, but it's true. And my task tonight is to tell you a little bit about the campaign and bring us back 25 years or before. And it wasn't as though there was not access to abortion in 1983, 82, when we started uh, meeting. There was access, but it was a very privileged access. If you were a middle class woman who could afford to go to Buffalo or pay a private gynecologist, you had the right to abortion. But if you were a low income woman, a woman new to the country, a woman from a First Nations reserve in the North, a rural woman, a young woman, a working class woman, you didn't have that right. And that was what motivated us to make a change because Canada touted itself as having a universal health care system. But it was so obvious to us Immigrant Women's Health Center, where Aisha works, Hassle Free Clinic, where I worked at the time and still do. We saw every day women coming in, sometimes without health cards, oftentimes with health cards. They didn't have the private gynecologists. They were the working women, the poor of the city. And what we had to do, and remember there was no redial, there was no cell phone, there was nothing like that in those days. I wonder how we organized, but we managed. And what we had to do is call at 8.30 in the morning to a downtown hospital clinic over and over and over again. And about 45 minutes later, the phone would be answered and the nurse on the other end would say, I'm so sorry, but all the appointments are gone. Try tomorrow. And then we try the next day and the next day. But this was our jobs. What about the woman on the factory floor? What about the high school student? What was she to do? And these were the women who were being denied. And this was what motivated us to take on this federal law. And it is amazing, a small group of women, then a larger group of women, and then hundreds, and then thousands, and then tens of thousands across the country became a part of this movement because we had to change the circumstance. Now we understood that the country was pro-choice, we felt that it was, but we had to organize that because we knew we were up a, against a conservative government in Ottawa, a provincial government here, and an organized anti-choice movement that was small, it was a minority, but it was very well funded. And we were just women and some men who felt we had to fight on principle. And we understood enough that uh, we had to change the balance of power in this country. And how do we do it? Well, we looked at the province of Quebec, where Dr. Morgenthaler had established a clinic and where the trade union movement again, the women's movement came together. And those two forces were able to create a circumstance where Quebec, once the PQ was in power, chose not to recognize the federal law. Ontario was different, but we felt that same strategy made sense. We had to organize, we talked to Dr. Morgenthaler, he had been through a lot as Judy explained, and he said in the end, yes I'll do it, but I cannot do it alone. We need to build a movement. He understood that from the very start, no matter whether they were different strategically at times, and there were. And so we had to determine, well, what is the strategy that will win? And there were always arguments, you know, is it going to be a male doctor, this, that. There were those arguments. But we fought our way through them. Linda and Bob Gardner know that very well. And uh, what we decided, we, we were going to develop a strategy to broaden what was the definition of choice. Because the legal right to abortion was absolutely critical. Because those therapeutic abortion committees, they denied women that basic right to make the decision herself. It was in the hands of uh, a therapeutic abortion committee, as you said. Three doctors, none of whom ever met the woman. Now in Toronto, it wasn't so bad. A lot of parts of the country, it was terrible. It was the access problem. It was the fact that the law didn't allow women to make that choice themselves. So what we said was, we're, well, what does choice mean? Well, choice means a whole range of women's issues. It means the right to birth control in your own communities, your own language. It means the right to be free of coerced or forced sterilization. It means the right to uh, express your sexuality whichever way you want, the right to employment equity, the right to a decent job, the right to childcare, all of these things. And of course, the right to full access to free abortion. Because we fought as hard for women to be able to have the children they chose to have. And that was a lesson that we had learned a little bit earlier, again, from the Immigrant Women's Health Center and women working with immigrant women. And Judy Persad, who was a major fighter at the time, is in the audience now. And that was very important. These lessons were very important. And so we were able, 
So even if someone did not feel that abortion was their choice, my mother, for example, 10 pregnancies, six children, Irish Catholic, it wasn't her cup of tea, but she also knew the reality of women's life. So we tried to allow for a movement that people like my mother or others could be a part of, even though they would never have had an abortion themselves. So this was critical, I think, the approach we took. We called it reproductive rights, they call it reproductive justice today, but that's what we tried to do. Now obviously, the issue of abortion came to the fore. We were trying to overturn the federal law. We were trying to establish freestanding clinics so no one had to pay. And the other thing that was so important, and we looked at movements in Italy and other places around the world, Quebec for sure, you needed the lawyers. If you're going to break the law, you needed a lawyer to defend yourself. No two ways about it. And tip of the hat to Morris, even though we had our differences. But we knew that Supreme Court justices do not stand in a vacuum. They see what's going on around them. They see what's going on in the streets of the cities and towns. And if we could change or organize the consciousness of people in this country so that when it came to trial here, even though Henry said, I broke the law. There was no joke about it. We we're not trying to say oh, we got around it somehow. I broke the law. The law is wrong. And Morris, and you don't hear lawyers saying that too often, said he broke the law. But you know what, Jory? You can make history in this country if you set these doctors free. And they did. They did because they listened to the people, the women of this country. And what happened in Quebec happened here. I mean, in Quebec, before, before our struggle, Henry was before, he was before lawyers there too, and, uh, and courts and juries. And when they raided the clinic in Quebec, they chose a woman, an African woman, an English-speaking African woman, and it was a Francophone jury, all white, Quebecois. And they tried to make that woman as different from the jurors as they possibly could. And you know what? At the end of that trial, and she was made to be on trial, as she wasn't the victim, she, well, she was a victim, she wasn't who was being uh, uh, charged, but she had to testify. Again, that Quebec jury found Henry innocent. And when one of those jurors was interviewed afterwards, he said it didn't matter her color, where she came from, her language, I saw her, my mother, my grandmother, my sister, my lover, my wife. And this is the kind of movement that we felt we had to build here. And it shows you, I think, when the ordinary people of Canada are given a decision of this magnitude to make, they make the right decision. They make the right decision. And that's what makes our movement so strong. So we felt we had to build a movement that was broad, as Judy and others have said, that was across the country, that was deep. And the trade union movement, I, I, that was the first place we went. We went, well, second. We went first to an annual general meeting of women working with immigrant women. And we got that support from women from racialized communities all over the city. And then we went to the Ontario Federation of Labor. And we had a big floor fight. But I will say Cliff Pilkey, who died recently out of the uh, United Auto Workers at the time, for whatever reason, and I don't know, he was totally behind a woman's right to choose. It was unbelievable. He was good. Wally Majeski, dead now as well. I have to say it, Maya. But uh, head of the Labor Council, the same thing. But we won that debate, and when we won that debate and got the Ontario Federation of Labor on side, it broke through into mainstream society. This was no longer just the women's movement trying to uh, fight for an issue on its own. It made a huge difference, and we organized. We went to union halls, we went to churches, we went uh, to schools, we went everywhere. We went across this country, and we saw the resonance. We saw the resonance. When Judy talks about the guys in the truck, you know, one of, the big, uh, one of the big rallies we had after the jury uh, acquitted and uh, the, the government here was trying to figure out will they allow it to open again or not, the anti-choice had a demonstration, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And our supporters told us, remember, they came and said, we've got to have a demonstration. And we did on the lawns of Queen's Park. The people have spoken. The clinic must remain open. And who came? And so we said, are people going to come? We don't know. Are people going to come? And suddenly, up they came, men with uh, cleaning coming back from their offices. We had women streaming over from, um, and men from the campus at University of Toronto. We had hospital workers coming up the, uh, the, the road from University Avenue, from the hospitals down there. And we had all these auto workers from Oshawa, out of nowhere, coming in. <laughs> and uh, it was an extraordinary thing. And we went from the Queen's Park to the clinic on Harvard Street, 
And the government in this province said, you can open that clinic, we're not gonna close it down. And it shows the power of people. And that, I think, is one of the most incredible lessons of this particular movement, that people together, when we use the power that's ours, the collective power that's ours, we can make change, we can change government policy, and we can push back governments that did not want to hear what we had to say. And I think these are lessons for today, critical lessons for today. We saw the same thing when the new law they were trying to put in, Mulroney was trying to do that, and uh, so many organizations came on side. Uh, we thought they didn't have a chance. Well, when it got to Parliament, it looked like they did have a chance until the Senate, by one vote, they one vote, they, they, they squashed that new law, and we haven't had one since, and I think because of the power and the energy. Now, today, you look at the circumstances, we have no law, that's great, but you hear conservative MPPs in this province saying they want to defund abortion. You have Tim Hudak, who a few years back signed a petition saying he would support the defunding of abortion. Denies it now, of course, but we've got it. We look at the PEI. In PEI, there is not one abortion facility. Women have to go out of province. In New Brunswick, you have a situation where there's one clinic in Fredericton, and of about the thousand, I think, abortions that are done, correct me if I'm wrong, Arlene, Sherry, uh, in that province, something like 700 or more are done in that clinic, and what? Women have to pay because the government of New Brunswick refuses to accept the dictates of the Canada Health Act and the, Mul and the, Mulroney, and the uh, Harper government refuses to enforce it. So when he says, Harper says, I'm staying away from this issue, I'm not gonna reopen the abortion uh, debate. Well, as Angela said it, it's absolutely a lie. They're doing it every which way they can without facing us head on. And they are doing it and women are suffering because of it. So we see these private members bills. We see uh, you know, conservative MPPs spouting off about defunding abortion. Well, I remember when they defunded abortion from Medicaid in the United States, I remember the first woman who died, Rosie Jimenez, a young, poor, Hispanic woman in Texas who went to a backstreet abortionist. And we do not and will not allow ourselves to go back. But the thing that I find encouraging, many different polls, but the National Post did a poll. They did a poll very recently, in November. And the questions, and I'll, I'll, I'll end up this way. Okay, do you think abortion should be legal in all circumstances? 60% of Canadians. Legal in some circumstances, 30% of Canadians. Illegal in all circumstances, 8% of Canadians. So it's 90 to 8, my friends. And I think this is what we have to keep in mind when, you know, the media says, oh, it's such a difficult issue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not a difficult issue. And when people like Jillian and Anjali and all the other medical students for choice that are working with us, talk about being 25 years old or just turning 25 or whatever, and they're, they weren't even alive when this all happened. <laughs> I do a lot of stalking in high schools in the GTA, and it's very, very racialized classes from every community in the world. Aside from the small few, everyone, boy, girl, man, women, whatever they may be at that age, they are pro-choice because they were brought up with it, and they do not want to lose it. And I think our task today is to continue the legacy of Henry Morgenthaler because if Henry Morgenthaler had not agreed to open that clinic and that clinic became a symbol of women's resistance to an unjust law, if he hadn't done that, I don't think we would have had the same outcome necessarily. I'm a socialist. I believe in collective action. I believe that is the way change takes place. But there are also individuals at certain moments who rise to a challenge at great personal cost, and it makes an incredible difference. Henry did that. We all work with him. I'm not suggesting he could have done it alone. It was the movement that made the change, but it was Henry Morgenthaler that sparked the movement and sparked the hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands across this country. We have a lot to be grateful for. We celebrate today, but we've got to continue the struggle for reproductive justice, make sure women in PEI, New Brunswick, women in the North, women on First Nations Reserves, women without status, in this country have full access to free abortion. That's our task, and I think we're up to the task, particularly with all the wonderful young women and men who are coming up with us. So thank you very much. <laughs>